Hello and a very warm welcome to this event on Global Britain and the G7, making a success at the June summit. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. We've been looking forward to this event. This is a big year for British foreign policy. The UK holds the G7 presidency and from the 11th to the 13th of June, the Prime Minister is going to be hosting the leaders of the other G7 countries for a summit at Corbis Bay in Cornwall. The government's promise that the UK's departure from the EU will allow global Britain to flourish. What does that mean? We're not the first ones to ask that question. Do we get any clues from the Integrated Review for Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy, which was published uh, just recently? What can the UK achieve during this G7 presidency? And how should the Prime Minister approach the G7 summit? How should other countries as well? Well, lots of questions there, and I know you're going to have lots of questions. We've got a terrific panel to discuss all this. I'd like to welcome first Elizabeth Dibble, who's Chief Operating Officer at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And she joined Carnegie in January 2017 after 36 years as a diplomat, really focusing on everything that uh, feels still very current, Europe, the Middle East, economics, trade, much to talk about there. She was Deputy Chief of uh, Mission at the US Embassy in London as well from 2013 to 2016. And she's speaking to us from Washington, DC. Hi, Elizabeth. We've also got with us uh, Cherno Barr, co-founder and co-CEO at Purposeful, an organization that works for girls and their supporters to have access to the resources, the networks, the platforms that they need for their activism. Purposeful is rooted in Africa, but works all around the world. We were just discussing how many countries it was in before this started. He's led initiatives for UNFPA and others and is an expert advisor to the Security Council on Youth, Peace and Security. And he's joining us from Freetown in Sierra Leone. And David Liddington, chair of the RUSI think tank, uh, which specializes in defense and security, also on the IFG board, I should say, he was conservative MP for Aylesbury from 1992 to 2019. He held many ministerial posts, but particularly relevant to the, today's discussion is uh, his time as a minister at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office from May 2010 to July 2016. And he was leader of the Commons and Secretary of State for Justice and many other things as well. So very warm welcome to them all. Just a few housekeeping rules, only a few. There are a lot of people watching this and thank you all very much for joining us. Do send in your questions then uh, as early as you possibly can. So that it gives us a chance to uh, sift through them. Post them into the Q&A panel on the right of your screen. I will try and get in as many as we possibly can. Uh, great if you can add your name and where you're speaking from. It always helps uh, us uh, to just give that bit of context. We're going to be live tweeting from IFG events using the hashtag IFGG7. Please follow and tweet along. And we're going to have a video and sound recording of the event on our website within 24 hours. So just in case you haven't seen it all, or want to pass it on. Well, with that, let's kick off. And I want to start with David Liddington, who uh, is indeed speaking to us from Britain, uh, from Buckinghamshire, and um, he is going to just take us into the British perspective. David, thanks for joining us. And perhaps you can just give us your take on what the government should aim to get done at this G7 summit. Well, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, I think that for Boris Johnson and, and the British government, this is a really important moment. Um, if you look at it in terms of raw British politics and international politics, this is the first really big opportunity that the Prime Minister and his government have had to demonstrate that after Brexit, the United Kingdom is still a serious player on the global stage, that it can help to move and shake and influence events, even though uh, we are no longer part of the, the, the EU. Um, and then the government's just published a very wide ranging, very thorough analysis of the UK's international challenges, the so-called integrated uh, review. Um, it's a strategic um, review covering the defence, diplomacy, international development, policy, trade policy and so on. And this is a chance for the Johnson government to show that they are beginning to deliver on some of the key objectives of that uh, strategy. So it seems to me there's probably three things that will be at the forefront of the Prime Minister's mind. First will be to show that he is helping to shape 
a successful global response to COVID. So I think we'll probably hear more about COVAX and about international initiatives to get people around the world vaccinated. Secondly, he will want certainly to see an economic recovery globally from COVID, but also for that to be what's termed a green recovery, because the next big global opportunity for Britain is going to be chairing the COP26 climate change summit in Glasgow in the latter part of this year. And this is a chance to get the G7 countries and the other invitees uh, together and to try to get them to at least start to agree on a common approach to that summit and the next chapter in carbon reduction. I think there'll be a focus on green finance, green energy, um, green technology as a way to combine carbon objectives with, um, uh, with, with economic growth. And then finally, I think he will also want to make a start in delivering on what he also set out in this integrated review, which was a concerted approach by the democratic world to the economic and strategic challenge posed by China. The really big issue for the Johnson government is, not, is going to be not just getting a communique, but then about how you turn a communique at the end of this G7 summit into a plan of action and actually see it delivered. David, brilliant. So that's given us a wonderful span of what the UK might be looking to achieve. Cherno, I wonder if you can take us into how it looks from your perspective. You're not speaking from the UK um, and the UK government's um, preoccupations can look very different when one is on a little bit of a distance. What would you like to see from this G7? Cherno, hi, is it? Cherno, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, Great. sorry, I, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I don't know if you can hear me. There's a little bit of a delay on the... Now. Um, um, sorry, okay. for, yeah, Brilliant. the dancing uh, Thank you so much for having me. I think... Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and, and hope that you're just, hearing. Just go, just go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm joining you from Sierra Leone and Purposeful is a global organization. We're based here um, in Sierra Leone and we, our work um, with partners in over 90 countries around the world. And we've been thinking and reflecting on what the what world we're in now and what opportunities um, this G7 presents for the world and for UK's leadership. Frankly, a lot of our partners, a lot of folks who are working in the front line of the epidemic, who are working particularly with girls and women, have seen too many promises made and promises broken. And I think this is an opportunity for the UK and for the leaders of the G7 to indicate, to, to demonstrate where the priorities are and what sort of world we want to build. What sort of world we want to build back and how that world is going to look like. Because I think we've seen very clearly that uh, girls and women on the front line are being con uh, marginalized even in general normal times. And in conflicts, in emergencies like we're witnessing around the world, this marginalization is doubled down and not just from the emergency itself, but from our priorities, the political priorities, what happens, what we fund how we fund, who receives resources, who does not receive resources, who's in the room, and how girls and women's lives are completely cut out of the equation. So what we're really hoping the UK government will do with the leadership of the G7 this year is to indicate the shift that our partners and our allies have been calling for for so long. So we talk about with the response to COVID, is it an equitable response? Are women and girls prioritized, not just in the way that the vaccines are distributed around the world, but also in terms of how the economic recovery plays out, mm. who is part of the recovery, the centralization of the care economy, which is absolutely critical, which is often being ignored, and which we know 
is critical now in particularly countries like ours in Sierra Leone and with our partners around the world. And one thing that I should say as well up front is we also know that violence against women and girls has always been the shadow uh, epidemic that we've lived through and we continue to live through. And how are all of these priorities? You know, the UK government has spoken a lot about their interest in girls' education. We've said many times that girls' education cannot be a priority if you do not think about the other things that affect girls' lives, the barriers that hold girls behind, the, the culture of violence in these countries, and who is in the room, who's accessing resources, and how all of this plays out. So what we really want to see is an indication of this, is promises that have been made that should be kept and how these priorities play out in these discussions and what the actions are going to be. So we have some high hopes for the UK's leadership and we're hoping that it comes through in the conversations um, and in the priorities that are set. Chona, thanks very much indeed. And just just um, perhaps just take us in just a little further, if you could, into what coronavirus has meant for girls and women. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's not just coronavirus. So I, you know, I, I live in Sierra Leone, and before coronavirus, we also had uh, we had experience with the Ebola pandemic, and we've seen similar patterns. And we started drumming up and calling attention to these things that in an epidemic of this nature, the girls' lives. So girls and women are now exposed not just to the health emergency this is, but they are often at the front line of the response. They are primarily in the unpaid care economy um, and their lives are also subjected to additional other emergencies. So we know that sexual violence increases in Sierra Leone during the Ebola epidemic. We saw that uh, pregnancies among um, teenage girls increased and the government responded at the time by, by banning pregnant girls from school. We've also seen the increased globally, increase in domestic violence as well against women and girls. And when girls and women do not have access to move about freely, we know as well that social capital is critical for particularly girls' lives, especially in poor communities. So when these epidemics strike and we have increased restrictions on movement, we know it places additional burden on just having access to food, having access to security, and having access to just your general um, mental and general well-being. So unfortunately, while we know this is the reality, what happens typically is in the responses, it is treated as if these are all secondary. So we go back to the traditional ways of responding. And this is where we hope that the G7, the international partners, the global leaders will really make clear that we have seen this now. It's so in our face, it's so visible that we mm -hmm. can no longer ignore what is in our face. And this has to be, it means we need to change the way we respond and the way we do this kind of business. Chono, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. It just gave, it gives us that bit of a fuller picture. Well, Elizabeth, I wonder if, if we can now wheel round to Washington and the American perspective. Um, New wish president, um, high hopes, um, the first G summit, G7 summit since he came in. What, um, what do you think, what would you like to see from this summit? And what do you think the US wants, which may not be the same thing? Good morning from Washington and thank you for having me. I think President Biden's um, overriding message at this G7 summit will be that America is back on the global stage. After four years of America first and multilateralism being shunted aside, um, I think President Biden will be really focused on restoring the global standing of the United States. I think in terms of specific priorities for, for the summit, um, many of them will mirror his domestic priorities, the things he's focusing on at home, starting with the pandemic and the impact of it. Uh, internationally, this includes vaccine distribution, especially in poor countries, um, strengthening the World Health Organization, preventing future pandemics, and just yesterday, the U.S. named um, Gail Smith, who was the former uh, administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, as um, she will be in charge of COVID diplomacy because the U.S. recognizes that although we're moving along fairly smartly in terms of vaccinations, we're not at the top of the list, but we're not at the bottom either in terms of, of people vaccinated, that um, this 
pandemic knows no boundaries. So it doesn't do us, any of us good to focus just at home. We need to focus internationally um, to, to combat the, the pandemic. Economic recovery will be a strong message um, supporting strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive recovery. Um, jobs, growth, um, dealing with inequality in all of its forms. Um, as President Biden has said here at home, uh, this is the time to go big, as you've seen with the, the stimulus package that he has, um, he has put forth. And um, as David mentioned, climate change is a huge priority for the United States with John Kerry being named as the um, U.S. International Climate Envoy. He's already been uh, busy traveling uh, to a number of places. So with the uh, Glasgow meeting later this year, this will be a, a, a primary focus for President Biden in, in the G7 as well. Elizabeth, thanks very much indeed. And perhaps you can take us into um, one of the questions I wanted to ask first, um, but would love to hear from all three of you on, and that is what we should expect in the way of vaccine cooperation. So the G7 is about cooperation. Um, as we were saying right at the beginning, it doesn't always emerge with a great communique full of very substantial things, but it does try and uh, uh, um, advance agreement between some of the world's most powerful countries on some things. And we have at the moment countries trying to uh, race ahead with their own um, vaccine programs, but really knowing that uh, no country is safe until the whole world has made quite a lot of progress on this. So Elizabeth, what do you think we might see or might want to see on, um, on vaccine cooperation? Um, I think this will be a push uh, in, at least from the United States for, in, for this summit. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the G7 members that have developed vaccines. We've seen the Chinese, the Russians, and, and others um, pushing out their vaccines. And, and I don't think at this point anyone has a, such a proprietary interest that it has to be, you know, from the U.S. perspective, it does not have to be an American vaccine. What is, what is really going to be key is how to ensure access to a vaccine or a set of vaccines, however, however many you know a, a country uh, can can manage, but that that the availability of vaccines has to be expanded, and it has to be there's going to have to be financing available for that to push it um, into into places in Africa, in Latin America, in in places where we're still seeing the virus uh, raging. So I think you will see a push for cooperation and not, this is not a, a competition, if you will, but it, I think what you'll see from the Biden administration is a real effort to um, make the point that it is in the global interest to have avail vaccines available, readily available, cheaply available, and this has to be done quickly because the pandemic is still raging ahead. Mm. OK, so in the communique that we might be drafting, uh, you know, in this event uh, to see what we want from the, 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 the G7. OK, we're going to have vaccine cooperation up there. Chono, what um, what do you make of vaccine diplomacy and how one country ought to help another, what the world ought to do together about vaccines? Can you hear me, Cherno? If the feeling's a bit of a delay. Um. Cherno, could you you were nodding as I was talking about vaccine diplomacy. Can you can you hear me, Cherno? You you can't hear me. Yes, I can. Brilliant. I can hear you now. You. Yes. Yes. OK. Vaccine diplomacy. Your thoughts. Oh, yes, um, absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the one of the I, I think what we saw, what, we, what we're seeing with the COVID um, epidemic is just 
the way inequality plays out in the world, right? We're here um, in the developing world, just looking, and especially with the last U.S. government, um, and you know, our lives and the lives of poor people around the world were um, being regarded as a as a secondary, if not in fact a not even part of the conversation and we had to wait essentially for the crowns and you know efforts to think about this as a global um, action that will include everybody in the world um, and in terms of quality in terms of access I mean that's a real problem and that's a real problem for the world and, and I think what we what we've seen with the with the epidemic is you cannot just shut out your borders. You cannot just shut out your respective countries and be like, oh, we're just going to vaccinate all of our own people and leave you all to perish and to die. What we really need is a global response, an integrated response that does not just prioritize the lives of every human being in the world, but also that takes into consideration inequalities. What happens to particularly marginalized communities? What's happening, in, including with, as, as I've said before, with women and girls? And how does not just access to this vaccine, but access to healthcare in general, particularly for women and girls, access to reproductive health, which again, now we have a US government that um, is interested in that issue, is demonstrating um, um, that uh, you know, they wanna invest in, in, in women's rights and women's health across the world. And the UK government, which has always been a leader in that I think the G7 also has an opportunity to integrate and to think about vaccine diplomacy as I think integrated with health diplomacy. Um, how do we make sure that every life, irrespective of where you are, and we're thinking about all of this because we've seen, you cannot just shut it out and just focus on your own population. You have to think about the entire world and bring everybody around the table. Okay, and if China, for example, makes uh, a big drive to sell or to 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 to, um, to get its vaccines to Africa and help countries. Uh, there's been quite a lot of reports that it have in it has in more than a dozen African countries. Does that consolidate China's influence in those countries? And is that is that something we should worry about? Frankly, I'm not worried about China's influence. I think uh, it's for the Western countries have to think about what your, what the worries are. I think what we've seen is, you know, the first set of vaccines we received at this end of the world are, were from the Chinese. Um, there are questions about, you know, efficacy and all of that. But if you're drowning and somebody's providing help for you, you're going to reach out and, and, and take that help. I think the question it raises, for, again, for the UK and for Global Britain um, and, and, and for the US is, what's your what's the role you want to play in the world and how are you going to play that role if you uh look more inward which we've seen sadly some of the actions with the aid courts with um some of again the focus on just the own respective citizens and not with the rest of the world somebody's going to step up and try to feed, fill that void and what we're seeing increasingly is china is being very aggressive in stepping up in trying to fill that void and again, as I said, for most of our countries, if you're drowning and you need uh, access to resources and somebody's out there providing, and we know that for China, it's not free, right? They're gonna, they, they're providing these things in exchange for a lot of other things. But if we want the world that we, I think we, we want, which is a much more equitable and a just world, I think this is something definitely that the, that the G7 needs to think very seriously about. Uh, Jonah, Jonah, thank you for those points. David, can I come to you on this and how Britain should play it, particularly against the background of several months of rather bad-tempered uh, exchanges with the European Union on this? Yes, I, I think it's been a, uh, some of the, the the rhetoric in the in newspapers on both sides of the channel and some of the remarks by senior politicians. And I'd say, look, as a pro-European, I'm afraid that from politicians that's tended to come more from the the European side than the UK side. But it's very sort of frankly demeaning to um, the countries involved. I mean, it's inevitable that a democratic government anywhere in the world is going to be very attentive to, to the demands of its own citizens. But I think it's really important that the G7 recognises that, as uh, Turner said, this is a this is a global challenge um, and you know, none of our countries is safe 
until this pandemic is brought under control everywhere in the world. Um, I think the G7 should be concerned about how both China and Russia are using vaccine diplomacy as an instrument of soft power. But I think you know, Turner is perfectly correct to say, look, you know, if you're in the position where that is what's being offered to you and that can stop your people getting ill and dying, you're of course going to take that help. And it's much better people have a Chinese or Russian vaccine than no vaccine. But I think G7 is an opportunity for the developed world to get its act together, to restate their understanding that this is a global challenge with, where vaccines have been developed internationally and they need to be distributed through an international effort. I think Boris Johnson can point with some justification to the UK's contribution to COVAX as a you know, very significant down payment on such a commitment, but the G7 can do more in terms of distribution through efforts like COVAX, but also there's a big issue over intellectual property, transfer of vaccine technology, and how you, you ensure that the pharma companies get sufficient return to actually enable them to keep researching and to keep manufacturing and developing vaccines to improve them, um, while at the same time ensuring that vaccines are actually affordable for countries where net incomes are very, very low indeed. Well, uh, th thanks very much indeed for that one. And and particularly, you know, with regard to the European Union, do you think we're out of the woods that, that, that the European Union and the UK have a, a arrived at an agreement? Um, or is there more that you'd like to see each doing? I think I think what I've been encouraged by is, for, is first of all, the public rhetoric on both sides has, has calmed down. The, the, the last couple of weeks. Come out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and secondly, I'm I'm sort of starting to read reports about greater optimism in France, Germany, and other EU member states about um, the 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 rate at which uh, they now hope to roll out vaccinations in those countries. And I think look, it's good. If I'm saying it's good news for the UK if our closest neighbours do actually overcome the early problems that they, they did have. And you know, it's another occasion perhaps to go over the whys and wherefores of those problems. But if they're coming through them, great, because those countries matter to the UK in terms of commercial uh, relations, in terms of political relations, in terms of people taking holidays, visiting each other's countries. Mm -hmm. um, but then actually it clears the way for some agreement on an international focus, which I think is what Jenna in particular drew our attention to. Yeah. And Elizabeth, I mean, David mentioned right at the beginning China, and I wondered what you thought the Biden administration was going to try to get out of this G7 in the way of support um, for um, standing up to China, if you like. Um, as we know, uh, India, Australia, South Korea invited to uh, attend. Uh, and these are these are countries very much where there might be a common interest in this. Yes, uh, China's neighbors, if you will, have been invited to attend. I mean, China is going to be um, the elephant in the room uh, it, because China will be part of the discussion, whether you're talking about the response to the global pandemic and vaccine diplomacy, you know, the, the origins of the pandemic, uh, it'll be certainly one of the topics when you're talking about economic recovery uh, because of the, the role China plays in the world economy. Um, and it will be certainly touched upon when you're talking about climate change and, and climate diplomacy because we need China in this, uh, if, you know, if, if for this to, to work. So I think the challenge will be how to um, how to address this in a way that provides a, a way forward, if you will. How, how to you know it, it it's not going to do any good for everyone to sit in Cornwall and complain about China. But what's the what's the the, the path forward? And is it a united front on the part of the G7 with the invited guests as well to, to address some of these issues? Is it an agreement to do um, for each member of the G7 to do what they can do individually? Um, you know, and, and when you're talking about China, there's 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 these issues, but then there's the whole range of 
human rights issues and labor issues and you know Chinese influence issues. So it's, it's sort of how the G7 grapples with this and gets its collective arms around the issue of China as China is ascending to be, you know, the G7 is 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 meant to be the the, the global economic powers. Well, the, the big global economic power is not part of the G7, obviously, and China is continuing to um, ascend. I don't know when it's going to outpace the United States as the, as the largest economy, but it's you know, it's it's hard. You can't ignore it. And so there, there cannot be a summit that doesn't have a focus on China, but how they focus on China and, and how the Chinese perceive that focus is is going to be um, not just interesting, but very important. I mean, the, the Chinese, as, as I think we've all seen, don't like to be uh, felt that they're being either bullied or pushed into a corner or and, and you know, the, the Chinese will respond back. So um, I, I don't have a great answer on how the G7 will deal with this. I just know that they they have to and, and China will permeate every aspect of the G7 discussions, I, I predict. Thanks very much indeed for that. Um, and, and you put it, you put it very well. It's a conversation that is is much more um, pervasive and expansive in Washington. I've I found and in, in the United States overall than it tends to be in the UK. But the the kind of ambivalence that you were talking about is very much written into the UK government's recent integrated review. On the one hand, we want to uh, trade with China. On the other hand, we want to uh, stand up to it, uh, particularly when it starts making very assertive moves in its own region and so on. And you describe absolutely, I, I thought you put it very well, it matters what China thinks of what is said, um, because we've seen retaliations uh, very recently against politicians, um, uh, journalists, academics, and so on. Uh, so the language on that one uh, really mattering. I want to take us into some of the questions now, um, and there's a cluster on a point I was uh, I was going to ask if no one else did, but uh, inevitably quite a few had, and that's Britain's recent cut to its aid budget um, as a proportion of a GDP cut from 0.7% to 0.5% and at a point when GDP fell, so that's quite a cut in the aid budget. And we've got several. We've got one from Robert Morland uh, in Gloucester, uh, 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 former uh, Conservative MEP um, saying is is the UK government hindered in this G7 by its the significant cuts in its uh, in it, in its aid budget in achieving what it wants uh, at the G7. We've got um, one from Peter Bolding, a bit more acid, if you like, saying how is a uh, such a cut in development aid budget signaling signaling the seriousness of global Britain, and uh, so another from um, uh, someone who hasn't given their name about um, the U.S. putting a lot of it, uh, weight on 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 aid, but uh, look at what Britain's done ahead of this. Um, David, you and David, and then and then Cherno, I'd love your your views on this. Well, I mean, my my sort of top line view is I think I think this cut was deeply regrettable. The and I think it will harm, sadly, the uh, the the government's efforts to deliver on a very ambitious G7 and broader strategic agenda for um, a number of reasons. I mean, this is going to hit hard at the discretionary aid spending, if you like, because a lot of aid spending is tied up in long term commitments that you can't just cut dramatically. So the burden of the cuts are going to fall on uh, crisis uh, assistance, but it's also going to fall on things like some of the scientific programmes, uh, because aid money goes into um, British uh, research and science, and some of that goes into uh, carbon reduction uh, projects. Some of it goes into uh, vaccination efforts being made around the world. So both those objectives, carbon and vaccination, seems to me are bound to be harmed by this cut. I mean, the COVID recession that the UK and pretty well every other country has experienced in the last year meant that 0.7 was going to mean less cash uh, in the forthcoming year than in the last year. Now, that I think could have been justified, but difficult. But to go further and say 0.5, I think was too far. In fairness to the British government, 
you know, the British aid programme is still, I think, the largest bilateral uh, development programme anywhere in Europe. It's one of the largest in the world. So uh, we mustn't sort of uh, somehow uh, denigrate unnecessarily what is happening. But I, I do very much regret uh, the cuts to 0.5. I hope that the government will, even at this stage, think again. And if they do take it through, that they will restore it to 0.7 at the earliest opportunity. Well, we have the sense, as do others, of a, a something of a tussle inside the cabinet on what should happen after this year. Chernor, your your um, your views on this? Well, thank you very much. I think um, you know, I'm not surprised that so many people care about this uh, question. We, uh, for us, we this is we, we our perspective on this is twofold. Even without the cuts, we have to acknowledge that aid resources are scarce and are not meeting all the needs that exist, particularly for women and girls programs, which are oftentimes seen as secondary. Um, and I know the UK government had before now said they, they really care about girls' education and have demonstrated some interest in it as girls' education. But even at the best of times, the resources that are available are not optimal. And we have to basically move heaven and earth to get access to these resources, particularly if you're working in the field that we work in, if you're a grassroots uh, feminist organization, if you're a women's rights organization, if you're a girls' organization around the world. And then you compound that with now when the resources are needed the most in the middle of a global pandemic, when we've just said about all the problems that women and girls face, and then you now have to deal with what is a significant cut. I think what, what I've said before is the, the, the cuts definitely feel like a god punch to many of our partners around the world. Um, and it, it almost gives the impression that the UK government is not putting into practice fully what it's advocating. I think the timing of it is terrible, not just for G7, but with the pandemic as well. And, it's, and, the, and, 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 and what it means more than just the timing is that it, there's a real effect, um, effect on real lives, right? So the effect of, of it's have looked at analysis, for example, in Nigeria, if it's a 24% court or 63% court, it will mean thousands of, uh, of, of, of girls will not have access to um, life-saving uh, sexual reproductive health facilities, education uh, opportunities will be limited for us and our programs as well here we're already experiencing the effect of those cuts. I think it definitely undercuts the UK's um, moral leadership and authority, and it, and it definitely leaves questions. And I hope that those questions are answered in the positive light at the G7, because an opportunity to rethink, and you cannot really be the leader of the world in the midst of everything that's happening. And you're signaling that actually at a time when the world needs so much more resources, you're cutting your resources and spending it on other things. I think for a lot of people listening, it's important to say these are political cuts. They are not just made possible because all oh, the UK now has less money. I think Sir David mentioned there will have been less money anyway, but the cut itself is a political decision on what matters. And it's you're saying that these programs I've just talked about, girls' lives, education programs, sexual productive health programs, are not as critical to you as they ought to be. Chernor, thanks very much indeed. Um, Elizabeth, what do you make of this? Does it undermine global Britain? I Sadly, I think it does, um, because Britain has been known as a leader in, in uh, development assistance, and Britain has always been very proud of the 0.7% uh, of GDP that it has expended. And at a time when the world is is facing this existential crisis of the of the pandemic, to see that assistance has, you know, been been decreased, sends a signal that Britain isn't playing the same role. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, Britain was a leader in terms of you know the the percentage of GDP that Britain had been expending on development assistance was very commendable. Um, you know, it, it, it is higher than others, but people people forget that and they're just going to look at the cut and the and the absolute number, I fear. 
Yeah, I mean, the UK government would say, I would guess, um, pick up on your, your last point and say, look, we've been very, we've gone ahead of many others uh, for many years in this year when we're having a lot of difficulties too. We're stepping back for a bit, how long a bit is uh, to be decided, uh, but they, they would certainly dwell on that. But uh, you may well be right on the uh, the the image and what it does at the uh, to the UK's reputation at this particular G7. This particular time when um, Britain is trying to be to present itself as global Britain and a leader on the world stage. Yeah, the timing is unfortunate. Let me move on to another key thing about this year that um, that David referred to at the beginning, and that's net zero and uh, the greening of the economy. We got quite a few questions on that this, but one from Julian Wathan in particular saying. Um, David cited technology as a is a key uh, contributor in getting to net net zero. What should um, the government's strategy be to change people's behaviour uh, across the G7? So this really, it really applies to all kinds of uh, uh, of governments. Uh, David, do you want to pick that up? And I, I'd love um, views from all three of you on this. I think I think that um, G7 can be the occasion for. A, a useful uh, discussion and uh, comparing of experiences on on this uh, about what works, what doesn't work. I, I'd be deeply reluctant to, the, the, to, to lay down that there should be some sort of global rule that every different government in every different country should be encouraged to follow. There's some things I think could be done on a, on a global basis and some common rules on emissions trading systems, on carbon border adjustments, I think would be a good thing. And those will take quite a time to to hammer out, but the G7 will be a good time to make a start. I, my, my own view is that when you look at individual behaviour, um, that I, 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 I will uh, approach this from, from saying we should look at uh, market mechanisms wherever possible. You look at uh, uh, pricing of carbon, you look at uh, taxes and uh, uh, and duties and, and uh, to, uh, tax incentives, on the other hand, to in, in encourage people to move to uh, lower carbon usage. Um, you give businesses incentives to invest in uh, low and zero carbon technology. And you get you're seeing this in the developed world with automotives already that you get to a certain critical point and the companies all then go in that position in that direction because they can see the way in which the world is is moving. Um, but I think um, so I think that needs to be done. And, and the, the line behind that we need to, through the language of governments, encourage the moves that are happening in the financial world towards green finance, towards imposing uh, zero or carbon reduction conditions upon major investments. And I'm very encouraged when I talk to people in senior positions in the City of London, the institutions there, they tell me that the city is onto this and they are pressing ahead and we can expect to see the private sector the investment world come up with uh, uh, conditions and standards of this kind in the relatively near future. Chernow, what should we do about this? Net zero. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was just looking at some data um, a few days ago about where, for example, underdeveloped countries like Sierra Leone or developing countries like Sierra Leone um, kind of feature in the climate change crisis um, um, and and while the rest of the world contributes in significantly to um, destroying the climate, uh, countries like Sierra Leone are the receiving end of um, the worst of it. And I think what we, from our perspective, is the G7, the opportunities of these industrialized countries is to think about, again, inequality. I think at the end of the day, what the opportunities are for creating a more equitable world and how can we make sure that um, countries like us are able to effectively leapfrog um, in the development process. We don't have to go through the same patterns that everybody else has, got, has gone through and that kind of destroys and undermines our planet. Our planet. Uh, but we, we don't have access to those technology, to the resources and to the assets. And I think, again, it, 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 it's similar to the conversation we were having earlier on about the COVID pandemic. It's to think about the world as one world and to think about how when we generate solutions, there are solutions that are equitable, that are accessible 
to all around the world because it's you know it affects us, it affects our world, affects our climate, affects everybody around the world. But the the, the thinking, the solutions cannot just be centralized to the countries that have the resources. I think that's the overwhelming message from our perspective. Thank you. And Elizabeth, we have President Biden at the, at the summit, not President Trump. Uh, makes a difference. Um, what do you think the US is going to, how is the, how is the US going to, to pitch its, its stand on, um, on carbon reductions? Um, obviously, this has been a huge debate in the United States. This was a, a huge piece of the um, electoral debate this year. Um, I think that um, the point that's been made before that uh, there is not necessarily a one size fits all solution to this, but that um, you need to look at the experience and the the situation in each in each country. I think you are going to see a push from the US for incentives for investing in um, green technology, green energy, um, whether it be um, energy production or, or cars or, th or things like that, um, and to, to develop finance schemes that go along with this, that promote um, clean energy, you know, promote green technology. You know, here in the U.S., you just have to look at this crazy year we've been in, um, you know, on top of the pandemic, we've had wildfires, we've had crazy weather. I, I think people are starting to believe in this a little more, but I don't think there is, you're going to see from the Biden administration at least, sort of a, a one-size-fits-all um, solution to this. A lot of this is in related to entangled with domestic politics here in the U.S. and, you know, the, the Green New Deal that um, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party was pushing is not something that the Biden administration itself has uh, embraced, uh, you know, lock, stock and barrel. Um, they've, they've looked at pieces of it and implementing pieces of it. So I think you will see, um, you know, there, there's a huge effort. Climate has been incorporated into the remit of virtually every aspect of the U.S. government, whether it's the Department of Transportation, obviously the Environmental Protection Agency, but the Department of Commerce, you know, the Department of Treasury. So from the Biden administration, I think that's what you're going to see, that climate is no longer seen as a standalone issue, but is a component of everything we do, of, of every aspect of the economy, and of it's certainly a strong component of President Biden's foreign policy, as I mentioned with John Kerry um, in his very prominent role. So I think you will hear a lot from the U.S. on climate and and how uh, how to attack this this problem that is is a worldwide one then again, doesn't respect borders. And as, as has been said, what happens in the United States or what happens in Britain affects what happens in Sierra Leone. And so this has to be a, a there has to be a global recognition that this is a problem that we have to deal with globally. No, no, thank you for that. Now, obviously, we're only talking about the G7 response in this, and we've got, as David was saying right at the beginning, the COP summit um, towards the end of the year, which is going to hang on other countries' response, particularly that of China again. So, presumably, we'll be looking in this to um, you know, a bit of positioning by the G7 of how they might want to put pressure on China to to take part in that. But th thanks for that that characterization of the, the Biden administration, um, which, as you said, has put a lot of emphasis in a short time on this point. I want to cover some interesting questions now on, on, on technology and digital technology, which has been such a feature of the pandemic. Chen, I want to start with you because there's a very interesting question from Alamatu uh, Di Monachina, the founder of A Girl at a Time in Sierra Leone. And the question is begins by saying, to buttress what Cherno is saying, we're seeing many more girls facing challenges to access services and vital information around safety uh, during the pandemic, particularly around sexual and gender-based violence. 
and the online space has been very successful in reaching girls, what should the G7 be doing to uh, for, for digital access for countries like Sierra Leone? And David and Elizabeth, I'm going to come to you in aspects of the, the kind of tech question. But Chernor, I'd love to start with you on that. Yeah, thank you very much. And hi, Alimati. Um, the, the, I think as Alimati said, the premise of the question is with the pandemic, again, the, the problem with some of these problems is we keep repeating ourselves. We saw very similar patterns during the Ebola outbreak. You know, girls out of school, we needed to get creative. And I hate to even say innovative because in this day and age, having access to basic digital tools is no longer what innovation really should be. But in our communities that are still very rural, unconnected, do not have access to even teachers, even in normal times, um, and now you take away social capital from particularly girls and women, the problem doubles down. And I think what if, if G7 focuses on improving the full humanity of particularly marginalized girls and women, technology, making sure that girls and women have access to digital tools has to be critical. Because, for example, when, when uh, COVID hit in Sierra Leone purposeful, our programs, we shifted most of our programs and we provided access to tablets, mobile phones to girls who were meeting in communities. And these tools were what we used to disseminate information across. But the scale, and this was with FCDO funding, with the British government funding. So that's a, it's an example of what can be done. But it, it doesn't need to be ad hoc. It needs to be systematic. It needs to be beyond the pandemic. It needs to be institutionalized. It needs to make sure that it's happening over a period of time and there has to be a system but the technology for this already exists. The resources already exist in these G7 countries. But what is happening is we're receiving it as crumbs in this part of the world, in other places around the world. And some of those resources are what are in danger of being caught. So I think the thinking from G7 has to be, again, you cannot address girls' education by just thinking about paying girls' fees and things like that. You have to think about the fullness of girls' lives. And girls' lives, access to food, access to sanitation, access to full comprehensive reproductive, uh, um, reproductive facilities and, and services are important, access to technology, because when you don't have electricity, when they are at home, they are also exposed to greater um, security threats, which then affect their lives, which stop them from going to school. So the response, the thinking on this issue has to be holistic. And I think technology is an important tool in a comprehensive thinking around this issue. Thank you very much indeed for that. And David, I, I want to come to you with this and actually stir in a question from Dan Dalton from which um, saying what level of appetite do you think there will be for coordinating a shared uh, approach to the regulation of big tech? Um, and and uh, he's saying also in the light of recent high profile events like the newsfeed controversy in, in Australia, um, the, you know, the big tech companies have owned the lockdown, if, if you like. Do you and, and there's a repeated um, attempts by uh, countries within the G7 to talk about taxing them more, more vigorously. Do you think that this is a theme and do you think it would get anywhere? I think it, I think it is a theme. Uh, I hope they can make a start on it. I'd be pleasantly surprised if, if the Cornwall G7 summit came up with a, a worked out solution at the, the end of the day. I, I think that uh, there are two uh, and strands to, to this. One, one is that there is concern amongst electorates, you know, amongst ordinary you know, families throughout uh, the G7 countries about the power of the, uh, the, the big internet service providers and about the how you get the balance right between the, the wonderful freedom of uh, expression and exchange which the internet provides and on the other hand the, the people's fears about the risks to to privacy uh, and and to the security of of information um i think that the one of the key conversations here is going to have to be between the european commission who have um you know, the lead authority on much of this agenda for the european union and the united states the two biggest markets and i think one of the 
challenges for the UK government post Brexit is going to be to how to make sure that they are in the room and part of that discussion. Uh, when those necessary conversations take place. I think that with a Democrat administration in Washington, there's a better chance than there was under the Trump administration of a, some sort of transatlantic deal being worked out. Some of the big Democrat controlled states have already introduced or considering introducing laws that are comparable in their approach to the uh, general uh, data protection regulation of the, the EU. So there may be a chance of moving forward. The, the other thing I just throw in, it goes back to what Elizabeth was saying earlier on about China um, will imbue almost every debate mm -hmm. in international affairs. Um, <laughs> there will be concern about made in China 2025 and this big strategic drive openly by the Chinese government of the Communist Party to achieve global leadership in all the key 21st century technologies by the centenary of the revolution in 2049. And, and where I think the Johnson government got its integrated review absolutely right was to say that things like Huawei or TikTok are frankly a sideshow. What the challenge to the West is, is the West you know, plus if you like, the democratic world more generally, is how do we make sure that we have the capacity in uh, new generation telecoms in synthetic biology, in quantum computing uh, to actually stop us becoming entirely reliant upon Chinese suppliers for any of these new technologies. And I think that is the sort of conversation that a frank discussion at G7 ought to make possible. That's um that's really uh, helpful. Thank you. The technology is reminding me that we, we have about four minutes left. Um, Elizabeth, um, the big tech companies, American heroes, global villains. How, how's the US going to approach this? Uh, they're both, I think. Uh, and and you see this. There's a there's a debate in the US about this as well. Um, you can't live with them. You can't live without them. I think is 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 what we're seeing. Um, but I think David's point about um, we the the rest of the world aside from China needs to make sure that we continue to advance and 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 in the technological uh, world you know AI all these these kinds of things and that we don't get too tied up in knots about regulating what we have now that we're going to miss um, you know that the companies aren't going to have an incentive to continue to to innovate, it's it's really I see the tech issue sort of in, in in two different levels. There's there's we we need to continue to encourage innovation and investment and things like that, but at the same time there has to be some sort of regulation. And as as David mentioned, this is being done um, on a limited scale by some states in the U.S. But to get back to um, Chimard's uh, point about access to technology. I mean, in, in places like Sierra Leone, you know, we're not talking about access to AI necessarily, but this is an equality issue. And yeah. and this has been demonstrated in here in the US during the pandemic, where even though all these technologies are available and, you know, people can access them, if you don't have a computer at home, uh, for your kid to go to school on, or you don't have broadband, then you're cut out, and this is you're you're seeing an increase in inequality as a result of this. The quality of education that has been provided during the pandemic has varied tremendously depending on internet access. Yeah. Uh, no, a very, very good point, which we could run a whole session on. Right, I'm going to try the the um, the Zoom stunt of squeezing in one more question in two minutes. So you're going to have about 30 seconds each for this. And it is uh, uh, from Anthony Smith of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Basically, should the G7 be uh, the D10 or 11, that is the Democratic 10 or 11, given that Australia, South Korea, uh, India are invited? Um, has the G7 had its day? Should it be bigger? Cherno. I am. I will say yes. I think it's always. Uh, I think uh, you know. I think the, the the pattern of the G7 represents a certain history that I think is changing. I think the world is changing. I think you need more voices there, and uh, uh, as a shining light for democratic um, um, societies, I think it's it's important to open it up. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. 
Yeah, the, the G7 was created in a different era, and if we were creating it today, there'd be a different membership as well. I think it's going to be hard to replace it. Maybe you have a D10, just as you have a G20 uh, as well. Well, we already taken in Russia and then out again. Uh, um, uh, so it's changed form already. David? I think this will be a good test in Cornwall. Um, does this this proposed new format work well? And, and do, for that matter, India, Australia, South Korea and South Africa all want uh, to be part of a G10, the, the D10 that supplants the G7, or would they see things as, as, as distinct and ke better kept that way? So let's try it out. I, I'd hold on to G7 until everybody is agreed that um, no, D10 in its place rather than as an addition is the way forward. OK, you're saved by it turning two o'clock for me debating that, uh, whether or not that is in fact an answer. Um, we're going to have to stop there. Thanks um, everyone watching uh, for these terrific questions. And there were lots more. And thank you very much uh, to, to our terrific panelists uh, from all around the world. And thank you very much to the uh, great IFG team who've put this together. See you all soon.